Welcome to the Asian Sewist Collective podcast. The Asian Sewist Collective is a group of Asian people from around the world brought together by our shared appreciation for fiber and textile arts and our desire to see more Asian representation in the sewing community. In this podcast, we explore the intersection of our identities and our shared sewing practice as we create a space for Asian sewists and our allies. I'm your co-host, Ada Chen, and I'm recording from Denver, Colorado. Denver is a traditional territory of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples. I'm a Taiwanese-American marketer turned entrepreneur, and these days you'll find me running my all-natural skincare business called Chuan's Promise. That's C-H-U-A-N apostrophe S, Promise, in sharing my marketing tips on my blog. Most importantly for this podcast, you can find my sewing at i.hope.so on Instagram. And I'm your co-host, Nicole. I'm based outside of Chicago, the original homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, the Potawatomi, and the Odawa people. I'm a Philippine-American woman, a lawyer by day, and a sewing enthusiast the rest of the time. You can find me on Instagram at Nicole Angeline Sews. Hi, friends. Ghost Nicole here. Due to personal circumstances, which I addressed in the first mini episode for season three, I was unable to join Ada for her interview with Andrea from Third Story Workshop to talk about quilting. So no checking in about our projects this week. We're just going to dive straight into the interview. They had a great conversation and I'm sad I missed out, but I am just as excited as you are to listen. Enjoy. So we are back with another quilting episode. You might remember in season one that we featured Byra V of Strawberry Creek Quilts, who talked us through the quilt pattern design process, setting up her quilting business, the differences between quilting and garment making, and some of her favorite tools for quilting. Since then, uh, Nicole and I have both tried our hand at quilting. I've made a few baby quilts to varying levels of success, and I think Nicole made a quilt coat, and so we'll post all all of those makes in our show notes. I am also currently working on more baby quilts, or I should be, based on the time frames I need to ship them off to the babies that are arriving soon. <laughs> um, but the world of quilting is vast beyond just baby quilts and especially modern quilting. And today we are excited to speak with Andrea Tang Jackson of Third Story Workshop to learn more about modern quilting. Andrea is a Canadian quilter of East Asian descent based in Halifax, Nova Scotia in Canada and describes herself as a textile artist, quilter, author, and teacher. And we hope to dig into each of these aspects of her today. Welcome, Andrea. Can you tell us a bit more about yourself and your business, Third Story Workshop? Hi, Ada. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of the podcast. I'm excited to talk to you today. So yeah, my name is Andrea and you might know me online as Third Story Workshop. The name came about six years ago when I started uh, quilting. So I started quilting for real, I guess. It was actually <laughs> when I, I'd made about four quilts before that. Uh, but I joined my local chapter of the Modern Quilt Guild in 2016, the Maritime Modern Quilt Guild. And that's really where my quilting journey kind of took off. Uh, in that first few months, uh, I started a business. <laughs> I applied to a craft show and I got in and I needed a, a business name. And Third Story Workshop came up because my sewing space was in the attic of my home. And uh, it was kind of like I, I called it my I called it my called it my sanctuary. I had really small kids at the time. And so it was kind of a quiet space. I could lock the door if I needed to, if there was another adult around. And uh, yeah, I can like, actually think with a clear mind and play around with fabrics. And so <laughs> uh, that was kind of the name where the name came from. I wanted it to be not too sewing specific. I have a background in design and architecture, and I wanted to be able to fold all of my creative and design self into my business. And so I didn't want to limit it to uh, quilting and sewing necessarily, although that would be a big part of it. And so that kind of that neutralish name that doesn't necessarily refer to uh, sewing and, and, and quilting uh, directly in the name. The, the kind of another layer of meaning for Third Story Workshop is that I have two kids and this this is my third story. Uh, and um, I, we'll see how where where that story goes, I guess. That is pretty clever and pretty thoughtful. Um, when you started Third Story Workshop, I guess, was that when you started sewing in general or did you start with quilting? Like, how did you learn? 
It's a very good question. And I think that a lot of us as sewists will have this uh, understanding that I am a uh, serial creative or serial <laughs> hobbyist. Uh, I have done a lot. So since my childhood, like my kindergarten report card talked about how I really liked doing crafts. Uh, in high school, I, I did some like jewelry, beading, a lot of paper crafts. So like making greeting cards and things like that. I spent a lot of time in my room at my desk making stuff. In university years, I was studying architecture and um, my roommate, who was not creative at all, <laughs> she decided she, she wanted to try silversmithing. And there's a, there was a lot of different uh, resources or different places offering craft courses in Montreal, where I was living at the time. And we took a jewelry smithing class, silversmithing class, which was really fun. Uh, I also, at that time, got my first sewing machine in 2005 from my mom for Christmas. And so I dabbled in making bags and things without patterns. I just it was like, I like this bag. I want to make another one. <laughs> and, and then I tried my hand at replicating those things without really knowing a lot. And without having the resources necessarily of, well, I guess blogging. So I'm blogging was starting up. And so there were some things I could find on um on you know on blogs uh, and less on YouTube but still some on YouTube and um, I was like screen printing kind of like screen painting hacks like using glue instead of like proper uh, shooting screens and things like that uh, so yeah I've done a lot of different creative things and I love learning new things and um, so you know I've, I've been sewing for a while but How not did she well. know to get you the machine um I don't know. I don't think I even asked for it. I think she might have just thought I would like Fate. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was a little like Kenmore from Sears, uh, I think. Um, yeah. You know, I don't think we even talked about it. She did sew a lot. I mean, she sewed a lot. She sewed when we were kids, my sister and I, and she sewed, sewed us dresses through the garments that were. I didn't know until like 2017 that she had ever tried quilting. And she, she showed me some, some things that she'd done. She'd done some like hand hand quilted kind of whole cloth quilt blocks, which are pretty cool. Um, but that didn't, she never took to it. So yeah, I don't, I don't know how she knew, but she and I are very similar in a lot of ways. And now sewing is your business. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Yeah. So you kind of talked about how you've always been into this creative process and trying different crafts. Were you always, drawn in addition to your architecture background to, I guess, creating your own patterns and designs? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I think that having a design background kind of makes everything possible in, in my head, not in reality, <laughs> not in reality. But I think as a designer, I think of a future, right? I think as creatives, we think of, we have an imagination to imagine a future something. And to get from the present to that future, there's a process. And so I think having that background to make it possible, um, to make, like, this is super cheesy. I would never say this. <laughs> like, make that dream come true. Like, you're just like, <laughs> um, there is a process to follow and to get there. And so having the confidence to know what those steps are and what the real, having a, a footing in reality of what that means uh, is was really key. I think it was, it's a lot. It was a huge confidence builder, especially as a young adult when you're that you're just finding yourself. And I, I this is I could go on for a huge rant about how design education is, is a, such a confidence builder for youth, uh, for for people in general. A really integrated way of looking at the world, interdisciplinary, and it's like amazing. I think everybody should have a design education, but that's. That's just my like soapbox that I like to stand on sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> it's like sometimes your brain is working a few steps ahead of your hands and you have to figure out how to make that sync up a little yeah. bit. Yeah. And even have a even step back further that and say, you know, five years ago, maybe six years ago when I started third story workshop, I had a vision for what I wanted to do. I wanted to 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 see craft be elevated. Uh, beyond a domestic art, which it was already, which it was already. It's just I didn't see it or I didn't know about it. But I have stepped into that world and started to understand it better. And 
um, been able to participate in that way. And it's, it's really cool to be able to say, like, it was, it's not, I don't, I don't believe in like manifesting something, just being like, I wrote it down six years ago. So I've arrived because I feel like I've accomplished, like, oh, it's not about that. It's just having an understanding of this is where I want to go. And so I'll just take one step at a time and look out for opportunities and, and have those things come together. So it's a, it's like designing a path towards kind of a vague future. Yeah. Yeah. Let's dig into that transition a little bit more because you said you kind of saw wanting to elevate the craft. So what was that actual transition into making more art style quilts, like a wall hanging quilt, let's say, versus a baby quilt? What did that look like, feel like, experience um, seem like to you? It's a really complex question to kind of define what craft is or crafts versus what art is. I think that's like you could have a PhD or a postdoc and like talk about that for your entire career. Um, So I think for me, understanding that it doesn't understanding the conversations around those that topic, but also not really ascribing to any of it. (laughs) I'm just going to fair enough. Yeah. uh, Kind of just taking the step at a time and saying, you know, this is what I need to explore right now. I think um, something's pulling me in this direction. Um, And I want to make a BB quilt over here. So I'm going to. And and so um, I think there's a lot of, for me, I'm always looking for opportunities to move quilting outside of quilting so we have a very defined way that we see quilting i know in instagram you have a lens you, there's there is a niche and you get kind of get funneled in of course the algorithm is telling you what to look at too and then so you think this is the entire this is the quilting world but it's it's an industry so you know it's going to get the you're going to be seeing the most liked the most funny reels or whatever it is now. Um, and, and so it's going to shape the way that you think about the craft. And so for me, I'm always looking, I'm always looking outside and, and kind of look at the periphery and then how it connects to the outside world. And um, for me, that has looked at a lot of different ways. I've, I did, a, I have connected to my local art, art community and uh, it's a fantastic way to understand the conversations around this topic. And uh, I had a mentor for a year through a mentorship program through our provincial arts organization. And so she really helped me to understand she I don't have an art background, I don't have an art art, art training. And so and she was is a retired art professor and so uh, in textiles. And so she was able to kind of also, I think that that idea even came from her that to like, you can understand the difference between art, art and craft and talk about it forever. But it, in the end, it doesn't really matter. Like you, that's not what's going to lead the way you make things or the way you look at the world. Um, so, so that kind of step into into the art world. Also, to be honest, money is is where I was also like I wanted to be able to make art and things that I wanted to make um, without the pressure of the market. And so I was looking for grant uh, grants, uh, funding opportunities, and so. Um, being able to articulate in grant applications what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it, project specific, um, helped me to 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 start looking for other ways to 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 express myself through quilting. Yeah. Related note: So you, speaking of that art community and art paying you. You were on the Art Pays Me podcast. And when you're on there, everyone should listen to it. We'll link to it in the show notes. Um, It's a fantastic podcast. But if you describe yourself as many things, right, quilting, quilter, textile artist, author, teacher. So on that podcast, I think you said that it was actually quite hard to start describing yourself as an artist. And I don't know if it was kind of through that process that you said of connecting with your local art community. Um, but it was much easier to describe yourself as a designer previously. Do you still feel that way? And do you still struggle with that? Uh, I, I don't anymore. It's actually, I didn't think I would see the day where it wouldn't, it didn't, wouldn't seem uh, like an uncomfortable fit to call myself an artist. But I just, I just ordered new business cards. And it used to say, <laughs> it used to say Andrea Sang Jackson, designer and maker. And I, this time it says artist and designer. So 
I did that. I didn't like, I don't know if that, that's even a thing. Like <laughs> I feel comfortable wearing that moniker now. And um, I don't know if it's because I have been professionally recognized as an artist or because uh, I have said it again. I don't believe in the manifesting thing. Like I don't think that saying it makes it true, but um their language does help us inform the way we think about ourselves. And so you try it on, artist oh, it doesn't really fit. And then you start doing things <laughs> and you're like, oh yeah, that was art. I made art like that, was, you know? And so, you know, if you're not limiting yourself, then it really, you can, I think you can, I, can, I grew into it maybe. I don't know. You're asking all these fantastic questions, Ada. I haven't answered these questions before in, in, the, in this way. Yeah. <laughs> I, some guests like to reflect and they're like, this is like going to a personal sewing therapy <laughs> session. <laughs> like I'm not a licensed therapist or, or a social worker. Um, but I, I think it's just interesting to dig a little bit deeper into what you do and how you think about it. And now that quilting like is your primary business and livelihood, you mentioned diving right in and getting into a craft show within your first few months. How was that decision like to make this a business what prompted that decision and how did it actually like impact you and your family because Mm -hmm. you've you've mentioned you have kids uh this is a really good question and also something that i had to kind of journey through i was at a point in my life when i started third story workshop where i was out of the workshop force i had taken a step back to have babies and time with them as as youngsters uh they're much bigger and less cute now but still cute (laughs) um uh and you know uh, it, it was a point of contention in my own, it was an inner struggle for myself to, to think about my work as, hmm. I kind of went in being like, if I was a single parent, could I do this on my own? Turns out that's a lot of pressure. Um, <laughs> and not really healthy. I don't think in the end, um, but definitely worth thinking about that, you know, can I have a viable uh, business, a vi- viable career in this work? Um, which m- made me think about my place in the market, in the quilting industry, and then thinking about my work as an artist. And right now I'm straddling both, I would say. Um, and sometimes I swing more to one to the other, but, um, but always thinking about, I need to make money from this. And it's not, uh, I contribute meaningfully to my household income, but it's not all of it. And I re- recognize that that's not a privilege everybody has. Um, and so, uh, but it, there's all these different models about, of thinking about how your life fits around your craft or your craft fits around your life. And so, you know, some people, their, their primary time is spent as a caregiver, whether that's as a parent or as a child of an aging parent, like these are realities, or maybe you, you have a full, you're a, you're a lawyer and that's your full-time job and that's, you know, 60 hours of whatever, 40, 60, 40, 60, 80 hours of your week or whatever. <laughs> and um, and so you craft bits around that. And so there's always these these different things that are tugging on all of us as, as people, um, and the way you prioritize it, sometimes you don't have a choice and sometimes you do. And I did have that choice. And so I wanted to be meaningfully back into the workforce at that point when, when I started Third Story Workshop, but on my own terms. And so I didn't want to go work for somebody else. And so the quilting thing uh, became a, a trial. Like it was just an experiment. Like, what can I do with this? And I, with my, my husband's pretty smart. So he was like, you know, writing patterns is similar to what a designer and architect does. So we, uh, as designers and architects, we conceive of an idea. Rarely does an architect build a building that they design, right? (laughs) And so they're coming up with verbal instructions and drawings and illustrations and a set of documents that goes to a contractor and the contractor builds something without them there holding their hand through it necessarily. Um, you know, there's touch points and things like that. So this is this is how I approach pattern writing. Um, it's the same same set skill set, just like on a smaller scale. And so, um, so you know, that was always going to be the baseline. This was something I could do, and it became that's how I think about it now. Is kind of my that's my base product is is pattern product, pattern design and production, um, which uh, 
you talked about in your in season one. And so, and then there's all these other things that I want to do on top of that. Does that, I don't know what your question was actually. In the- <laughs> <laughs> it was about how you get, how you got into quilting being your main business and source of income. And I think that pretty much summarized it and almost in a very timely way, if you consider what other folks are thinking about, you know, the news is always telling us about the great Mm. resignation and people having that kind of thought process of, I want to work on my own terms or on livable terms and and practical terms and not be kind of subject to late stage capitalism as we kind of all have been for the last Mm. many years on autopilot. (laughs) But away from economics. Yeah, and it's hard. Like, the system is very entrenched. <laughs> so, Oh, yeah. And I will point out that you are, um, you're in Canada. So healthcare, I've, I've talked to a few entrepreneur friends um, about this. I actually talked to somebody yesterday about this. I left my job, immediately became a caregiver for my dad. And had I not had a supportive partner whose health insurance I could be on, that would have been hundreds of dollars out of my pocket every month for my savings that would have made all the different ideas that I tried and and things that I tried right after that infinitely more difficult to afford. And it's infinitely more difficult for anybody who's single and working um, to afford in the States, at least, at least you have healthcare (laughs) covered to what I understand. Um, To a certain, yeah, to a certain degree. Um, I don't know if you follow one of our past guests, Leela Kelleher, Leela Sows, who recently busted her knee. We send our, Best wishes to Leela on recovery because that's just a really, really terrible injury from skiing, like the worst. Um, But she was documenting her kind of journey through getting all of that taken care of. And I think everybody from the States was like, oh, my God, (laughs) an ambulance doesn't have to cost $3,000. Oh, yeah, no, it costs $45. In in my province, it does. And and people... That's literally an Uber. <laughs> People get us get like when they get slapped with that amb- ambulance bill, they get like they're mad sometimes <laughs> with the forty five dollar. But anyway, yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, we've taken a really long detour, so let's go yeah. back to quilting. Um, you mentioned you're you're kind of at the forefront of the modern quilting movement. Um, to put it lightly. So can you tell us for our listeners who might be new to quilting or who aren't as familiar with it, what is modern quilting and are there like rules around it? Okay. So I'm not necessarily an expert in modern quilting, but I can tell you what I have absorbed and understood from my years. And I think my entire, well, yeah, like I told you, I joined the Maritime Modern Quilt Guild in 2016 when I started with Third Story Workshop. So it is a very big part of how I think about quilting. Um, ye, there's like a list if you, <laughs> uh, of things, um, but they are, oh, okay, so generally functional quilts, but functional can have a lot of meaning. So can be a wall, can be a bed. There's, uh, uh, there's a lot of negative space, a lot of solid colors, a lot of negative, um, a lot of um, graphic, a very graphic quality to them. Uh, this is actually one of my le- well. This is the only quilt I've ever made with all prints. <laughs> it just happened to be the one that was ready to hang behind me. Um, if you're listening to this podcast, you can't see it, but it's a Rifle Paper Co. like cute quilt of. It's called Express Post. It's one of my patterns from 2021. Uh, but I generally work in solids. I do work with mostly solids. I found that really helped. Worked when I made my first quilt with solids. When I discovered solid fabrics. I actually was like, oh, like, I think I might have a voice in this medium called quilting. And I didn't know anything about the modern quilt move- movement, which started in like 20, 2009 formally. I would say there was like Flickr and a whole bunch of other cool things that happened online in 2008, 2007, 2008. And then I think the Modern Quilt Guild officially launched in 2009. Um, and so um, are there rules? Hmm. That's a kind of a point of, con- I would say... A little contentious at this point because whereas the modern quilt get probably started off like we don't abide by the rules of traditional quilting they have become there's 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 like there are now <laughs> rules there's a new, a set, new of rules. set of rules and so yeah. you know but i think i think the the spirit of it is that we're always open to new things um and so 
there's there's that. So a traditional quilt will be, you know, what you imagine a quilt to be with tr- with blocks. They're in a grid. There's like borders, maybe sashing, which is like the separating separating the blocks. Um, and then a modern quilt quilting kind of busts all that. It's just like it could be anything. It could be like a a squiggly line. It could be, uh, yeah, like it, yeah. So it is, yeah. It's a, it's a funny. It's funny to see it come become the establish an establishment or an institution, and then it has rules. You're kind of witnessing um, a new creation of those rules, I guess, as yeah. it, as it yeah. happens. And it's kind of fun. It's, it's exciting to see. Um, yeah. So you also do a lot of foundation paper piecing mm-hmm. and me not being a quilter, you will probably describe it better. So could you please sure. explain what that is for our listeners? Yes. So foundation paper piecing is a way of, I describe it when I teach it, I describe it as like paint by color, but with fabric. And so you're actually sewing on paper and which determines the shapes that you're uh, producing in, in piecing and in quilt piecing. So if you imagine a traditional quilt block, you'll have, um, you're limited by the way you can cut fabric. So uh, your rulers, so you'll have 90 degree angles, you'll have 45 degree angles, 60 and 30 degree angles. And then that's, those are kind of the standard things, which is, you can, there's a million, like there's an infinite variety there already. But foundation paper piecing allows you to kind of break away from that grid and produce angles with very like very accurately uh, that aren't within those parameters. So, okay, so for those of you watching, this is um, foundation paper pieced. It is a pattern of a sleeping fox. Yeah. On a background of the fox is like orangey and brown. The background is a metallic print that I can't quite make out. Yeah, it's a floral metallic print. And the fox is very geometric, uh, but in all these crazy, like, kind of, it looks a little bit origami-ish. Um, there's a lot of, you know, angles, and nothing's really at a right angle. Well, yes, the fox's face is, but, that's, but it's also tilted at a nondescript angle. So, uh, so th- it has this, all these possibilities, and I love that because... It's your the the lim- the it's limitless then right you are not bound by what your ruler can help you cut, and um, so that's foundation paper piecing and I started doing that with my first uh, set of explorations in gem in gemstones and quilting and so I, I've produced uh, a series of first stone wall hangings in 2016 that were mostly these kind of faceted looking uh, compositions. Yeah, the gems are very cool to look at and then when I try to think of doing it I'm like I already I struggled with my first it's not done yet even I just I think I gave up a few seams in. I was just like this is when you explain it as painting by colors I'm like that makes sense but when I compare it to creating like a crotch seam on pants my brain is just like can't compute a little bit so I will (laughs) when I think about creating a crotch seam I'm like that's (laughs) three-dimensional I can probably like so it, it kind of that also bog, boggles my mind, but so you have all of these gem patterns. You have a great book called Gemology, which like even if you don't know how to do foundation paper piecing or want to learn how to do it, it's a great book just to look at the pictures. I would recommend. Um, it will be in our show notes. What was the inspiration when you did the study of all those faceted um, gems and also the book? Like, how did that kind of come about? Yeah. So I, when I joined the Modern Quilt Guild, uh, the Maritime Modern Quilt Guild, I applied to that craft show that I talked about with these gemstones. And so uh, it was just a, just an exploration because I love geometry. It comes from my architecture background, probably. Um, and <clears throat> it was really fascinating to me. I probably saw Kurt Pio's paintings. Uh, he's a South African painter. And he had, does these like very detailed, large scale, not huge, but like large, larger than life gemstone paintings. And I was like, oh, like that idea of something so tiny being blown up big and you could see all the detail was really cool. And then also the idea that this like very hard rock could be rendered in something soft was really kind of interesting to me. And that graphic quality of it, uh, the the way I did my first gemstone wall hangings was 
uh, very kind of minimal. It was like this, the gemstone on a white background. I called them quilted posters because I didn't really, like wall hangings weren't a thing in 2016. <laughs> yeah. Like I don't think it's only been the last few years that textile wall hangings have come back. I mean, they had a thing in like the 70s, 80s. Yeah, 70s. but as a term we use. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I called them quilted posters because wall hangings didn't, it didn't resonate with me or or anybody else really <laughs> or anybody like in the in kind of like a pop culture i guess like nobody would be like having nobody in their 20s had a wall hang on their wall in 2016. um so oh man it's makes me seem, seem like i've been doing this for a long time <laughs> 2016 feels like a long time ago but it wasn't <laughs> yeah. uh and so so you know these quilted posters uh, were just a fun exploration for myself. They were what I applied to the craft show with. I had to simplify some of them to be able to sell some because that was something that I was just kind of struggling with. What's the market price? What do people, how do people see quilts? How do people value quilts? Of course, they're valued more if they're a wall hanging than if they're on your bed because you, there's just, there's so a whole lot of psychology that goes behind that, which you might have explored on, on previous episodes of this podcast. But, you know, if you can find a bed covering at Walmart for less than $50, like a queen size one, um, you know, you, and, but you have to pay me $2,000 or more for a quilt that's handmade. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't compute for a lot of people. For some people who are very aware of what, uh, what it costs to produce anything uh, in North America, which is a whole other conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, that's, that makes sense. But if you spent, how much would you pay for a painting that was the size of a queen size bed? Right? Like it yeah. would be several thousand dollars. Yeah. It would be well beyond $2,000. So there's like this weird thing that I had to go through. Uh, I'm still trying to understand that fully, but um, I was talking about the gems. So um, after, you know, so I was, I couldn't make bed size gemstone quilts that just wouldn't be feasible uh, in terms of cost. And so they're very laborious. There's like lots and lots of pieces or, you know, 72 pieces maybe uh, in, <clears throat> in, in one. Uh, the book is a lot, it's simpler. Just <laughs> FYI, if you want to delve into it, it's not 72 pieces in, in the book. <laughs> uh, but I, so I made that series of wall hangings uh, and I, I, I got, I produced a, a collection of quilted products, which was not the intention when I started Third Story Workshop. I was actually going for patterns, right? That, that was what I was going to do. But I got sidetracked by this, like, craft show opportunity. I get sidetracked by opportunities a lot, for for, for better or for worse. Uh, so, uh, so when I was at the craft show, people were asking for patterns for them. Because, of course, people who go to craft shows are also crafty themselves. They just don't necessarily buy a quilt if they can make a quilt themselves. So... Uh, so, you know, I was like, okay, I got to get to making these patterns. So I designed, uh, four, a set of four patterns in 2017, beginning of 2017. And right after I released my last one, a large gemstone quilts by Kat Jones won best in show at QuiltCon that year. It was a 96 inch by 96 inch, uh, princess cut diamond with like oh lots God. of colors. It's beautiful. You should look it up. Uh, it's called it was called Bling, and so <laughs> uh, at the same time there was another artist, M. J. Kinman, who's been making gemstone uh, quilts for a very very long time for 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 several several years, maybe even decades before I came along. Um, and uh, she started selling patterns and things like that. Her gemstones are much more photorealistic, uh, so mine are a little more graphic and simplified. And hers are very, very cool. They're very, they're much more realistic looking. Um, and so a publisher, so Suzanne Woods from Lucky Spool uh, Media emailed me a few months, uh, in 2018. So a couple years after my first gemstone wall hangings. And she asked if I ever thought about writing a book. And I was like, maybe in like five years, like what about? Like I, it, was, it was really like, what do I what would I write a book about? I need to have some time of like some experience before I write a book. She's like, oh, well, gemstones and quilting are, are really, are kind of having a moment. They're kind of trending. I was like, oh, is that something? <laughs> is that a thing? Um, and so anyway, uh, from the examples I've given you, it was. 
And so she wanted to, me to write a book about it. And so I was like, sure. <laughs> like, I don't, you can't see my face, but I'm kind of smirking because I don't know why I had the audacity to think that I could write a book. But, um, but I, I said yes, because that's what I do to, op- I often say yes to opportunities. I'm getting better at saying no to certain things. But um, <clears throat> so we went on this very fast paced journey of writing this book and it was fun and a whirlwind, but, and, but it was like a tight timeline. She wanted to turn around pretty quick to capitalize on it. And so why between when she emailed me first and I, when I handed everything, everything in for photography and illustration, which was another, you know, yet another year after, uh, but I, I did all of my stuff in five months, six months, which is oh. very fast for a book. Yeah. Um, and it, I was like, is that reasonable? And my husband was like, uh, you would get bored if it was any longer than that. And <laughs> instead of like a slow burn, like it's just more like a bandaid, like just like a, take out the bandaid, do it really quick. It's going to be stressful. Why would why be stressed for 18 months if you can just be stressed for six months? <laughs> six months. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's because he knows me. That's not for everybody. Um, but that, you know, that actually worked, pretty, worked out pretty well for me. So timeline wise, around the same time, I think in 2017, you were also an artist in residence at the Canadian Museum of Immigration and you worked on a B quilt be in quotes. And can you tell us more about how a bee quilt works and the story behind this particular one? Yeah, sure. So a bee quilt, so B-E-E quilt, is a group quilt. It's something that you work on together. So a quilt guild will have a bee to, and everybody will make blocks, uh, you know, the same block, let's say, same similar colors, and it'll come together. Usually it's for a charity, co- often it's for a charity cause, or just an artistic expression. Um, uh, there's very cool uh, you should check out the Modern Quilt Guild's like winners, past winners of, of this Greek group or B quilt category. They're very cool, very, very cool uh, collaborative works. And so I, uh, the opportunity came up that uh, the museum was looking for an artist in residence. It was going to be their second artist in residence program ever. So it was the second annual. So since then, it's been, you know, there's been more. Um, but, but I proposed to make a collaborative quilt uh, out of uh, inspired by a book about a little girl, a fictional one, but a little girl who uh, flees Pennsylvania in the Civil War, and she has to leave her grandmother behind. And so her grandmother gives her this quilt top. It's a bear paw quilt, and she uh, brings it to Canada. They 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 flee to Canada for safety. Not an un, it's not an uncommon theme, although it's not that you know, <laughs> Canada has <laughs> its own problems. Everybody, it's not a utopia. Um, and so, uh, <clears throat> so I, I proposed to make this collaborative quilt with people that were coming to the museum and visiting the museum, and uh, they were telling their own narrative. They were all ter- telling their own narrative, immigration narrative through making a quilt block. And I didn't teach anybody to sew. That was not the point of the residency. The point was to express their story and understand. Um, you know, how they fit or how, what their story is. Cause you don't really, I don't often think about it. I don't think maybe we did during the pandemic, but this was before the pandemic before life was like busy. Do you know what I mean? Like we didn't, we weren't yeah. so navel gazing cause we had other things to do. Right. Uh, <laughs> and especially for immigrants, like if you think about an immigrant who came during the war, they don't have that time to think about like where they came from or why am I here? It's like those existential questions. You just got to survive. Right. So, you're just yeah. moving forward in your life day by day. And so a lot of a lot of times at the, this museum, people come back. This is a port. Uh, it's at the port here in Halifax. A lot of immigrants from Europe came through this port uh, between 1920 and 1970. And so when they have a moment to pause, usually later on in life, they'll come back to Halifax and visit this place. Um, and and so, you know, there's there's a moment of reflection to understand you know, really, why am I here? Why, why did my life, why is my life in Canada? You know, and where was my journey here? Why did my parents decide that we were going to come here? Uh, a lot of people, yeah, come to this place with the, with that kind of reflection in mind. I mean, there's also tourists who come and, and kind of enjoy the museum as kids and kids are like, oh, I don't really, you know, 
don't they don't necessarily know the whole their whole immigration story but some people you know if, if they have or they have been in canada for a long like many 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 generations they still can, have to reach back and think like i have french acadian ancestors for example and they came here before the english came or like they think have to think about their 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 relationship with their own history and and canadian history it, it was pretty cool so i um put together, you know, I kind of gathered these stories and really was a facilitator of them understanding their own story and got to group them according to theme. This only came to me in the middle of the process that these themes kept coming up over and over and over again, where people were talking about their families, of course, um, their grandparents often um, <clears throat> coming here for education or for work work opportunities. I come here for love. There's like people who are like, my parents met at university in Toronto and then they just one was from Hong Kong, one was from Germany, and then they decided to stay and have a family here. And that's, you know, there's really sweet stories. And that's, you know, there's some some people who come from, came because of conflict in their own, like, or conflicts in their countries of origin. And so all these themes are very, very human. They, they cross cultures. They are just part of who we are and uh, they're very universal. And so I got to group them into these, these thematic trees and make this gigantic quilt. Which is gigantic in that it's all it's, it's like as a wall piece is very gigantic, but it's like it's like a king size quilt. Let's say it's yeah, it's a ten by ten, and you keep saying like there's a lot of stories for listeners. It's called the Here and Elsewhere B. You should Google it; it will be in the show notes. But there are twelve hundred yeah. immigration stories, and so there were quite a number of people that I think you facilitated that connection with. Yeah, yeah, it was really really an honor to be able to listen to all those stories. And there were there's some really amazing ones I can't get into detail. Like I have a whole lecture about it. <laughs> if anybody ever wants to to, to listen, um, but it was a really amazing experience. It was the first time I felt like an artist for real. Um, I felt like I the the stories were my raw material, like and I was sculpting these stories into something else. And uh, yeah, I felt comfortable calling myself an artist uh, in that process. I still couldn't. Outside of that, I was like, am I still an artist? Or is this just like a one-off, <laughs> one-time deal? So, uh, but, you know, slowly building projects, unbuilt projects like that have made me, again, grow into that that artist moniker. And I think part of that is like both community and storytelling kind of being brought into quilting as a medium. So can you tell us a little bit more about your experience being an Asian Canadian quilter and representation across like modern quilting. We've kind of talked to them the podcast just by nature of like where we specifically live, like the Asian American experience across different contexts in sewing. And I'm curious, like for you who like lives and breathes this industry every day, what is that like? Oh, it's, it's, it's not weird. It's been a, it's been a journey. (laughs) I think I didn't really realize it. Okay, there's a there's a couple of steps for me. Stepping into quilting, I realized that I wasn't a man. It's really strange. Um, like, I think for my whole life, I was just like, I can just do what a white man does. That's just like, which is fine. I think it was it was a fine way to be. Um, but understanding quilting and the value that people put on quilts uh, as a domestic medium made me understand myself differently as a woman for one thing and which and then the next step came when I went to um to quilt con in 2019 and I know there's lots of different most cultures have some sort of quilting right but when I went there was like a handful of people of color so you know it was predominantly white people like Caucasian people at this event which was I mean it was an amazing event. I had a great time in it. Like, it was a really great time. But I did notice that, you know, there was a few uh, people of color. And so there's all these rich traditions that we don't tap into, because again, we see this world through a very narrow window. I think Instagram is so great to build community and understand quilting and get all the resources and, um, you know, kind of go on your own quilting journey. But that's not all. That's not the whole story. Right. We don't see all of the different expressions of quilting across the world there. Even for myself, I don't I don't speak Chinese very well. I understand it to a certain degree that um, the Cantonese. My parents are from Hong Kong, but 
Um, I also didn't have grandparents. My grandparents died very young. So I didn't have a person that I, people that I could speak the language to and practice uh, very much. So I, I have a limited understanding of, of Cantonese. And, you know, so I don't, I can't access the Asian, any uh, Asian influences in quilting very easily unless they're in English. And, and so there's a limitation there, which is sad, but I think we, we can get there where we are understanding that our world is very small and uh, what we see is very small and just a very kind of just a, a taste of what it is to be a quilter uh, across the globe and across time. And so um, what was the question again, Ada? <laughs> <laughs> what is it like to be an Asian Canadian quilter and, and what does representation in, in quilting mean I guess I'm also curious like has your cultural identity heritage or background shaped your business or your ideas in any way that you feel and do you you I think you've shared previously on other podcasts and interviews about how your understanding and knowledge about race and culture have changed and and I kind of see that in pointing out how white QuiltCon was slash is can you share more about like what has that journey been like for you, kind of understanding your identity and how does it come into your business and, and kind of mm-hmm. all of that stuff? So that's like five questions for you. Yeah. So <laughs> it's it's tricky because my training has all been Western in a Western context. And so even the way I understand design is very Western. Um, and and so I'm still learning. There's a lot to learn and there's a lot to dive into. My own history, my own kind of relationship to textiles is I don't really know the full story. Like I, my grandfather owned a textile trading company in Hong Kong. So he like imported and exported, imported whatever, whatever side of the world you're on, um, textiles to, to like retailers in, in the States, I think mostly. Um, and my, my uncle and aunt also have a similar business out of California. And so I don't, I don't really know much about it. Um, because again, he died before I was born. So um, I think textiles, th- I think a lot about them because all of our clothes come from Asia, right? Not all of them, but all, most of them do. And so there was there was one project that I worked on a couple of years ago uh, where I was cutting up a wedding dress and I was making it into a double wedding ring quilt motif. And <clears throat> It was a J. Crew dress. It was a second hand. I found it at a second hand clothing store. Tons of fabric, beautiful dress made in China. And like when I was cutting up this dress, I was thinking about who made that dress. And, you know, we, they're not neutral things, right? Um, this person, I was cutting up two dresses. Another dress was made, we, my mentor and I were looking at it. We think it was made here in Nova Scotia by like, the mother of the bride or whatever, a family member. Oh, wow. It was pretty simple, little 80s styles, a lot of lace, but like kind of like boxy shoulder. Anyway, Big it was, poofs. yeah. <laughs> so it was pretty simple. Like it, sur- like it looked like it was a home serger, home, like all these, uh, she, she looked at it and was like, I'm pretty sure this was made at a home, in a home on a on domestic machines. Um, uh, but this person who made, or several people who made this J. Crew dress were professionals, right? They, know how to make clothes that is their job and they do it well um and so i at that moment i think i felt a lot of empathy i felt connected to this unknown person probably a woman i did i kind of make up a story about her i don't really like was she happy with her job like she doesn't get to sew like i get to sew for a job right those are different stories um she, how did she get good at this? Like, how did she fall into this? Does that, does she make enough money to, to help, you know, meaningfully contribute to her family's education um, or livelihood or their, their life? And I think that relationship is, is different if you're, if you're, if you're not Asian, <laughs> like I think um, putting yourself in those shoes, I think we can be, we can do it. It's just a, that's what's just one more step of removal. But I know um, the value, it, it, it hurts when I see the value of, of, of people, especially in fast fashion, saying like, 
I actually, you know what? There's a, there's a part of me that internalized also, like if it's made in China, it's not as good quality. I don't think that's true. I don't know if it was ever true, but it's definitely not true now. Um, but I did probably hear that a lot growing up. I think there's, there's, there's a westernized part of my family history, having um, my parents having grown up in a, in a British call, like in, in British Hong Kong, right? That West is, Western is better, uh, better quality, you know, like there's, there's just that kind of idea that, that lives. Um, so like I'm colonized mindset yeah. carrying through. Yeah. And so I, I'm struggling to think about it. I, th- I think about it often, but I don't, I haven't concluded, I haven't come to any conclusions. <laughs> Talk to me in five years, Ada, maybe I'll have some answers for you. Yeah. You'll have new things to describe yourself as yeah. and probably more, yeah, more thoughts on it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've had similar discussions with friends, not Asian and Asian. Um, I always think it's like most interesting when Asian friends don't kind of understand the the fast fashion industry and what the implication of a $99 bridesmaid dress are or a $200 bridal gown are. Like the amount of skill that goes into these pieces. And like even, you know, like you were saying, a quote from Walmart you have to you that has to go through a long arm or something like an industrial version of that (laughs) to be quilted because it is actually like there are stitches in it it's not just painted on or printed on yeah um so I think it's it's interesting to kind of stop and think sometimes um especially when people kind of don't necessarily do that in their normal day-to-day uh switching gears a little bit I'm curious about where you want to see modern quilting go like how would you want to see it change if any and yeah do you see like an evolution beyond where it is right now I do and I've already seen glimpses of it um I would love to see Quilt Guild invite speakers from other backgrounds to to speak at their guilds and I don't mean like me because I have a very westernized background that's like I grew up in this I grew up in this culture and so and I was trained in this culture so I mean like people who have expertise and and knowledge in things that aren't uh what you see what what the quilting industry feeds us and I've seen the modern quilt guild do this pretty well and I hope people pay attention uh that I think last year they 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 partnered with the textile museum uh, and SAQWA, I think it's the Studio Art Quilts Associates organization, to fund these uh, virtual talks of academic people who are studying different quilting cultures and how quilting is expressed in different ways. And I think that's really important for us to want to understand. I think there, there's a hurdle for people. To, some people are just like, I just want to have fun quilting, like cute stuff, which is also okay. It's just, I think as institutions and organizations so we have we can take on that responsibility to say hey this is not all of quilting it's fun yes for sure but we can there's more that more to it and we can we can add more voices to this Um, one of uh, my partnerships in the last year has been with the black artist network in Nova Scotia and you know we see uh, African-American quilting And, you know, the different African-American quilt artists that have produced amazing different things, all different, really cool things. But here in Nova Scotia, there's also uh, a very historic uh, Black community, like several historic Black communities in Nova Scotia. I could get into it for a very long time, but I won't here. But anyway, uh, there are, there's a, there's a picture quilts that are produced by um, a lot of uh, Black artists here in Nova Scotia that tell stories and they're very cool. So if I will send you a, a, if we can find it, I'll send you a, the the link to for the note, show notes. But um, understanding, you know, my very local community and how that uh, what what quilting has been again, it's very segregated from from the modern quilt guild. Like there's no talking between the the like this this group of quilters, quilt artists and um you know the modern quilt guild necessarily and so bridging those gaps i think is uh hopefully something i would like to see in the future i don't know there's it's it's messy it's a bit messy it's not you know and it's work 
um, for, and so I, you know, there's people who, I hope there are people who are willing to put that work in and take, take up that responsibility to bridge, bridge our communities and learn from each other and celebrate each other. I think it's, there's so much good out there. I always describe it as building bridges, not wedges, especially between groups of color, people of color. Um, <clears throat> so I love, I guess I love the approach that you take to this in that it's kind of about building community and educating people and doing the work. You also happen to have a master's in education, which, you know, is impressive enough in itself, <laughs> um, aside from all your other accomplishments. But I guess I'm curious, like, now that you teach in the context of quilting, what do you hope to convey or instill in students through your teaching process? There's a couple of things that I think about. If I'm teaching technique, which is not um, <clears throat> my preference because I'm not actually – I'm very it's still I find myself to, I, I see myself as very fairly new quilter but there are some quilters that are deep dive deeply into technique and like master a certain technique and then can teach that technique very well. I'm not one of those people. I like I'm very project focused so I think I've come to realize that that my the way that I move from project to project is not to deep dive into a single thing but to chase an idea and find a way to express that idea regardless of technique. So I might come to, come to a totally different technical solution to one project than another because the idea is what I'm chasing. So, um, but I think in any any of the teaching that I do, both in workshops, whether that, and, and that's focused on technique, and my lectures is to bring people along in their creative journey. So it's always been a goal of mine. It's just like take that next step. And whether that's so that you can just be a little bit more confident in the way you t think about color or if it's just kind of broadening your horizons about how you think about your own quilting or um, just mastering a you know, foundation paper piecing, which is probably the, the technique that I have the most mastery of. And so that is always the goal is to bring people along in, in their journeys, just, just to push them a little bit, like not in a pushy way, just be like, let's take a step out or step forward or... Um, and so that is kind of what frames my teaching a lot. Yeah. So they can kind of improve. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think that there's so much, you know, I think there's so much creativity that we have and it's bound by a lot of parameters and a lot of constraints on our, on our time and our mental space. Uh, but if we want to, we can be a, a space of self growth and self-understanding and then also understanding of what's what's around you so speaking of kind of pushing people to the next level and kind of contextual awareness you were also I guess this is something that we've seen as people achieve like the next level in their sewing world related careers uh they're they become ambassadors of mm. things and and companies and so you are a spoonflower ambassador spoonflower the fabric printing uh company and i can't tell you how happy it made me to see you on that blog post um as well as leela kelleher who we've talked about uh, previously on this episode and then rumana dawood uh, aka the little pomegranate just on this list of this year's ambassadors i think you were on it last year as well can you share a little bit more about what you're working on in this space and how these kind of uh, endorsements and ambassadorships kind of help you and help your business evolve? Yeah, I'm pretty, this is my only ambassadorship that I've ever taken on or sort of sought out. Is that true? I think that's true. <laughs> I, uh, maybe, oh no, I was an overfill ambassador at one point too. Um, <clears throat> Um, but this one is really special to me because I spoon flowers. There's a lot of reason I like the reasons I like spoon flower as a company. I think uh, their practices are environmentally conscious. I think digital printing, as much as it's not not ideal, I think the technology is catching up. But it's people don't love it. But at the same time, it is responsible. I think it's a responsible choice to think about digital digital printing on fabric. It does take up a lot of less resources, a lot, a lot less water and um, human resources or, you know, and so 
that was it's something that I think about. And so using Spoonflower fabrics, that is one of the reasons I, would, I, I like doing that. Um, another thing is their, their commitment to diversity. I, they've always, for a long time, they've understood that and actually had it play out in their company. And so prioritizing that uh, is is important for some, you know, for me and when I'm looking for opportunities, is this company, what does their company look like? And can I contribute meaningfully to my own practice and then their business uh, by through through diversity and understanding different points of view and stories and things. So uh, I think, you know, I also, they pay fairly, which is not always like it's not always a given with ambassadorship programs. So that is something that I've thought about from the beginning. Again, like I was still think like you know the the attitude that like if I was a single parent, could I take this on and actually feed my family, <laughs> right? And my <laughs> and so I I'm excited. I I like where like they're fantastic to work with. And uh, actually, Leela and I are collaborating on something in the fall with Spoonflower, which is exciting. Uh, and so I'm, I just talked to her last week. So it's, uh, <clears throat> we're excited about it because we're both, you know. That is, that's exciting. And I can't wait for us to post all about <laughs> it. <laughs> um, obviously, you two are kind of leading in your own spaces and sewing, you and quilting, she and clothing and pattern design and inclusive patterns. I'm curious, you've also made some yeah. clothes as you've shared briefly on Instagram <laughs> um, in the copious amounts of scrolling that we've done in research for this episode. Are you interested at all in making anything else aside from quilts, whether they be art uh, for your wall or art for your bed and, and, and furniture in your house? <laughs> like, Yeah. So quilted clothes, I, I've made, so I've made, I have two pieces of quilted clothing. I'm making another one in the next month or so. The next, yeah, with Spoonflower as well. Um, but uh actually you know what oh they're going out on exhibit next week <laughs> in Fredericton and I won't get to wear them for a month um but they quilt so I made them in 2019 and this was actually bef- like I think it, quilted clothing was on the runway before that 2017 2018 and then now it's coming into like the fashion world like I mean like mainstream fashion um so yeah, so I'm always trying to think about quilted clothing because I think it's really cool in that it's so structural, like it's so bulky and it could, like, I, I think of it kind of like housing your, your body and like wrapping your body in warmth. I think that's why quilted coats were, have been so popular in the last couple of years because we want to be wrapped up in something cozy and warm. Um, we want to be comfortable and comforted, I would say. Uh, so yes, there are, I would continue to think about garments it's kind of ongoing i have another one that i'm thinking about um for a grant funded project i have a like i have a few i, I have i've printed out pattern okay do you want me to stop first okay sorry i printed out patterns for, like there's a couple of garment patterns that are pinned up on my wall <laughs> they're printed out large scale i just haven't done anything with them yet so it is always on my mind, Ada, and I will show you once I <laughs> get some more made. Hopefully, the spoonflower one that's coming up is quick. It's just a, it's a, it's a vest, so I think it'll be small, 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 and so hopefully fast. I'm not sure. Patterns on the wall. I don't have patterns on the wall. I have patterns in a queue, like physically lined up <laughs> to work on, kind of similarly, including quilt patterns. Um, but the the Instagram post of your, I think it would have been a Wixton shift or Wixton top from yeah. from a while ago. Definitely inspired by that. I had the same fabric. <laughs> I think a lot of people have gravitated towards that like jacquard quilted fabric from Merchant and Mills. But it's so great. It's so great. It's so warm and comfy. <laughs> and and you're definitely right about when you quilt something that it gives it that body and it's almost like the extra thread kind of helps it become that sculpture Mm -hmm. and so as we draw to a close you already kind of hinted that you're working on something with Spoonflower and Leela for the fall which we will be so excited to see is there anything else that you want to share about what's next for Third Story Workshop 
Yeah, there <clears throat> are two things. I have an exhibition going up next week uh, in Fredericton, New Brunswick at the Craft College there with my collaborator, Alyssa Kluett of Keep House Studio. Um, so that will be for local folks if they want to go to Fred if they're in Fredericton, <laughs> which might be not maybe not the audience that we're <laughs> talking to right now, but that's fine. Um, but having exhibitions is uh, one thing that is vital to an artist's work uh, to be able to show their work and to be able to talk about it. Uh, it's a ton of work to put together an exhibition. I'm actually sewing sleeves on some some quilts. Um, so uh, Alyssa and I have worked on a collaboration for the last year, almost oh, two years now, uh, called Fat Quarterly, where she is a screen, hand screen printer local she's a textile designer and she's hand screen prints fabric uh and so we put together uh designs from her in a fat quarter bundle and i design a pattern that goes with that and it's a little kit that you get uh, <clears throat> and so we're launching a new one in may which is exciting uh it's ginkgo leaf themed so it's exciting because it's, it's different um and i'll i've got a little bit obsessed with ginkgo trees i think they're so fascinating uh, and so she and I are putting onto this exhibit next month. So we get to see actually all of the quilts together, most of the quilts together, which is, uh, you know, we've only seen them separately in Instagram. <laughs> like I have the quilt. Like, so it'll be interesting to see all the fat quarters together and the quilts together as well as some of our own work. And then I have a public art project. So when I started out, I wanted to see quilts outside of the quilting world. I've alluded to this or mentioned this a couple of times already in this in our conversation, um, but I wanted to see quilts really, really big, like building size big. So I, in the last year, I've been working on a project uh, with the the province here in Nova Scotia, and um, I've designed some artwork that is going on a, a parking building downtown, and so it's very big. So <laughs> the first panel went up this weekend. They're about eight stories tall. And I haven't posted a picture yet. I've posted some progress in my stories, but uh, I don't have a permanent photo on my feed yet of that. But that will be coming. It's going to take months to get them all up. Uh, but construction projects, they're just, they're long. And the <laughs> timelines are long. Like we're used to, you know, sometimes on Instagram world, we think of projects is one minute long when we know it actually takes like five or six or 10 or 20 hours but this is like a, several like it's years years and months um and so and a lot of people and it's pretty cool to see it come together but what the, one of the main questions uh, through that project that i asked was about cultural appropriation um there are several cultural uh historic cultural groups in nova scotia that um i had got to have conversation with, with individuals uh, <clears throat> from those communities and um, it was a huge huge question it was it was a hard and that was the main I would say the main work of the project was having conversations around this topic it was tough but it was a journey and uh, yeah it's coming together I don't want to say that's one of our favorite topics on this podcast it's probably like the bane of our existence at this point <laughs> people are probably sick of hearing me talk about it but since that's months away from being done done or or posted kind of in a more final state where can our listeners find you and follow along and get updates yeah so you can find me on instagram at third story workshops that's three rd story workshop and thirdstoryworkshop.com and that's pretty much where those are the best best places to find me Amazing. Thank you so much, Andrea, for being on the podcast today. I really appreciated getting to know you and letting you let you letting me ask you all these invasive questions to learn more about you and your work. I'm so glad that you made time for us. And I'm sure our listeners will be excited to hear this as well. Thanks, Ada. Thank you so much for joining us on this week's episode of the Asian Sewist Collective podcast. If you like our show, please consider supporting us on Coffee. Your financial support helps us with overhead expenses and allows us to give back to our all-volunteer team. You can make a monthly or one-time donation at ko-fi.com slash Asian Sewist Collective. You can find this link in our show notes, on our website, and on our Instagram account. Check us out on Instagram at Asian Sewist Collective. That's one word, Asian Sewist Collective. You can also help us out by spreading the word and telling your friends. We would appreciate it if you could rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, or wherever you get your podcasts. 
All of the links and resources mentioned in today's episode will be in the show notes on our website. That's asiansewistcollective.com. And we'd love to hear from you. Email us with your questions, comments, or even voice messages if you want to be featured on future episodes at asiansewistcollective at gmail.com. This episode was brought to you by your co-hosts, Ada Chen and Nicole Angeline. This episode was researched by Ada Chen, produced by Arti Ravi, and edited by Arti Ravi and Henry Wong. Thank you so much to the other members of our collective who made this week's episode a reality. This is the Asian Sewist Collective Podcast, and we'll see you next week.